guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Kayla Williams. She is a veteran of the U.S. Army, an Iraq War veteran, served in the 101st Airborne Division. She's the author of two different books. One is Love My Rifle More Than You, Young and Female in the U.S. Army. The other is Plenty of Time When We Get Home, Love and Recovery in the Aftermath of War. Kayla, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having me. Let's start with your decision to, to join the Army. It wasn't your original plan. I do everything backwards. So I actually went to college, got my undergraduate degree, uh, worked for a couple of years, did all the things you're supposed to do in your early 20s, uh, had a steady boyfriend, bought a car, even bought a house. And then I lost my job and was kind of flailing around trying to figure out what to do next. I wanted money for graduate school. I wanted to challenge myself. I got my undergraduate in English literature. Reading books is what I do for fun. It's my favorite thing. So it kind of felt like I cheated. They gave me a college degree for doing my hobby and, and wanted to do something outside of my comfort zone. I felt like I was digging myself a rut, just doing what I was supposed to do and not choosing any of it, just kind of rolling along. And so the military was a way for me to get money for college, genuinely challenge myself, and also give back to the larger community. My mom was a single mom when I was a kid, and we were on food stamps a few times, so repaying that debt to society was really important to me. And learning a new language was important to you as well, right? Yeah, when I started looking at potential jobs, I found that the Army would pay me to learn a foreign language instead of me having to pay somebody else to teach me one. So I thought that was a really great opportunity. And that got you some expertise in the Middle East as well, correct? Yeah, it was just computer-generated number, random chance needs the Army that I ended up in Arabic as opposed to uh, Korean or Chinese, the other two big languages, when I started my training. And it was while I was learning Arabic at the Defense Language Institute that 9-11 happened. And it became immediately clear that my military career was going to be very different than it might have been otherwise. It was no longer a question of whether or not I would ever go to war, just when and where. And when were you sent to Iraq? I was part of the initial invasion of Iraq in uh, March of 2003 as part of the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault. And a couple months later is when you met your eventual husband, correct? Yes. Uh, since I was part of the initial invasion, we drove all the way from Kuwait up to Baghdad and from Baghdad beyond out to Mosul and Talifar and Sinjar. And while I was up on the side of Sinjar Mountain at an LPOP, Listening Post Observation Post, where my team did the listening and there was a team of forward observers that did the observing, uh, that's where I met Brian McGuff, who later became my husband. We didn't start da dating out there, though. It's not you know, super romantic environment. You can't go clubbing or out to dinner. But, uh, but I knew I was interested in him. He was smart, funny, handsome, um, really self-confident. Let's back up just a little bit on, sure. on the ride up uh, to that point over those uh, early weeks of the war when so much ground was covered. Tell us a little bit about what your duties were day to day there. So I was trained to do signals intelligence. Uh, my job was to do intercept and direction finding on enemy communications. But it seemed as if we had done such a terrific job on the shock and awe portion of the war that there weren't a lot of enemy communications in those early days. So when we got to Baghdad, there was this tremendous shortage of Arabic speakers. Uh, the civilian contractors that later played a really significant role hadn't arrived yet. It was too early in the war. And so even though I hadn't been trained as an interpreter, that's what I ended up doing. I went out on combat foot patrols with the infantry in Baghdad, helping to translate between the American soldiers and the local population. This was also in the era of you go to war with the army you have, and since there wasn't quite enough equipment to completely go around, uh, and the technical regulation was that there are no women in combat, uh, I did not have plates issued for my flak vest. There weren't enough for everybody in the unit, and the assumption was, oh, since, since you're a woman, you won't be in combat, so you don't need these. So it was a little strange going out on combat foot patrols and then realizing, this is probably a terrible idea. I should probably borrow plates from somebody else before we actually go out there on patrol. So what kind of action did you see on those patrols? Um, on those patrols, the, the worst experience that I had was one day when we responded to a call for a quick reaction force, or QRF, because some unexploded ordnance or UXO had gone off in a neighborhood and it had injured several U.S. soldiers as well as some local civilians and I translated while we provided first aid to the wounded civilians, um, one of whom did not make it. And that was, it was definitely the toughest single day of the war for me to not be able to save a wounded civilian and, and you know, spend a lot of time questioning if we had been able to do things differently, if I'd done my job better 
you know, could we have saved him? So that was really tough. Um, during other parts of the initial invasion, there were times that we took small arms fire. And then later, what came to be known as the insurgency, when it took root, we started taking indirect fire as well. How long were you in Iraq? I was in Iraq for probably 10 months. I was in the Middle East for a year total, but I got there, I got to Kuwait and spent some time getting ready for the invasion. And then when we were done, we had to spend some time in Kuwait again, cleaning all our equipment before we went home. So shortly after this initial meeting and initial interest with, with Brian, he was sent home against his wishes for uh, a break in his tour. And then when he came back is when his convoy was was hit. How much were you aware of what happened? Um, I, by chance, was not on the mountain when the convoy was hit. I was down at the at, at the FOB uh, forward operating base for refit, resupply, maybe some mandatory training. When we found out that the convoy had been hit, one of our guys from our unit had also been injured, but he was returned to duty, uh, and and I found out within a day from Brian's platoon sergeant that he had been severely wounded. Uh, he had taken shrapnel uh, to the head. It had penetrated his skull and tra underneath the Kevlar and traveled forward and exited near his right eye. Uh, so at the beginning they said, don't expect him to survive. You know, it's a very, very bad prognosis. And that was kind of the news for several days before they very cautiously upgraded it to say he's he's going to survive, but they still said don't. Don't expect to hear from him. Don't expect any good outcomes from this. And what seemed to save his life, based on what I've read in your book, is is his, his friend Bobby, I think his name was, who insisted on getting him that medical attention uh, as quickly as possible. Is that the way you look back on it now as well? Yeah, so because it was a mass casualty event, uh, there it was a, the, one of the first really coordinated attacks outside of Mosul where the convoy took small arms fire, and RPG fire, and there was an IED, roadside bomb, improvised explosive device. So there were a lot of people with injuries. And in those kind of triage situations, you have to uh, evacuate the people with the most severe injuries first. And people who are walking and talking are kind of automatically at a lower priority, and kind of miraculously, Brian was walking and talking. So the medics on the scene, their first instinct was, we'll just take him back to the aid station. He's not that high of a priority. But one of his, his good friends who was sitting next to him when he was injured was very insistent that since he had a piece of metal sticking out of his skull, he really needed to be put on the helicopter and evacuated for you know more intense medical aid. And luckily he was able to talk them into it and, and he was, Brian was put on the, on the helicopter and taken down to uh, Baghdad for emergency neurosurgery with what we didn't know until much later was the only neuro American neurosurgeon in Iraq at that time. So and if anything, it's one of those things looking back and finding out more information down the road, any number of tiny things had happened differently, he would have definitely died if the shrapnel had been just you know a fraction of an inch farther to the left or if that neurosurgeon had been you know out sick if anything else had happened he would have died he had um he had an epidural hematoma so he's bleeding into his skull and he was walking and talking but then by the time he got to baghdad he was decompressing and at that point if he hadn't gotten into surgery right away he would have died wow he was transferred to germany mm -hmm. and eventually to walter reed mm -hmm. And you were you mentioned before that they told you not to expect any messages from him, yet I don't remember how long it was, but you did get emails back from him when you touched base with him. Right. So the neurosurgeon uh, who operated on him in Baghdad thought that he would never be functionally independent, that he, would, he might never even walk again and would never be able to care for himself. Uh, but he, he survived and did far better than anyone expected that he would. So when he made it, he, he was stabilized in Launchstuhl, Germany, and then sent back to, to Walter Reed Army Medical Center in, in D.C. And uh, he started to do fairly well, much better than they would have expected. And so he emailed me to let me know that he had survived and that it seemed like he was going to do okay. Um, that was probably November by the time I heard from him. He was injured on October 17th of 2003. So it was several weeks before I heard from him, but we struck up a very cautious flirtation through email, which is always terribly awkward, uh, and, and started to get to know one another a little better. So because he seemed to be doing so much better than what you were told to expect, was it your impression that 
he still had obviously some recovery to do, but for the most part, he'd be okay. I didn't know anything about brain injuries. So since so many people are really just lazy in email, I didn't connect the fact that his emails had a lot of errors in them to his brain injury. I was just, it sounds so stupid knowing what I know now, but when he said, yeah, I think I'm gonna be okay, I just took that at complete face value and did not, I did not understand at all what the recovery from a brain injury, what that path can look like. And I didn't know anything about PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And so wasn't expecting that to be, you know, a comorbidity to, to also um, develop. So I really just, oh, he's, here was this, this great guy who's emailing me. So uh, I was just excited and didn't either was blind to or maybe willfully ignored any signs that anything was wrong. Just about a minute before we hit our break here. It's interesting, when you first met, you kind of had this uh, playful friction of, mm -hmm. of a banter, maybe, is the best way to put it. And so there were kind of these good-natured insults uh, going back and forth. And so then when you reconnected, there were kind of moments of flashes of anger and, and, and that sort of thing. Did, did you think that was still part of that original personality, or were you starting to kind of see at that point that this is changing a lot? You know, in those early days, I was still dealing with my own reintegration as well. And I was dealing with a lot of flashes of anger. And so many of the other soldiers that had come home with us from the Middle East were exhibiting symptoms of post-traumatic stress of some kind. So trouble sleeping and angry outbursts and you know, hyper aware of potential threats. So since that was kind of my normal for, for me and for other soldiers that I had come home with, I didn't see it initially as abnormal for Brian either. Okay, we'll take a short break, come back and continue this conversation in just a moment on Veterans Chronicles. Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Kayla Williams. She's a veteran of the Iraq War, 101st Airborne Division in the U.S. Army. Her most recent book is Plenty of Time When We Get Home, Love and Recovery in the Aftermath of War. And uh, Kayla, obviously much of this book deals with both of you dealing with the uh, severe traumatic brain injury that, that, that Brian dealt with. But just before the break, you were talking about how it was tough to pick up on, on some of the problems he was having as a result of your own transition and reintegrating back into uh, American society. And I think that's part of the book I think a lot of people appreciate as well because so many people who don't necessarily go through something as traumatic as Brian did still struggle in that way. And it's something that a lot of people who don't go through it don't understand. So mm -hmm. talk about your decision to, to explain that quite at length in the book and, and how you hope that might help some other people. Yeah, the way that I came to think of it is that a lot of what in a safe and secure situation we may think of as symptoms of post-traumatic stress in a combat zone are helpful survival traits. So being hypervigilant to potential danger and ready to respond with violence, these are useful <laughs> ways of existing in the world in a combat zone. And it's totally normal for that to take a while to wind back down when you come back to a safe environment. Um, and that was my experience. My symptoms faded within about six months, and that's fairly normal. It's not something to, that you need to necessarily be concerned about. It's only if they persist and harm your life that it, it starts to drift into disorder territory and be something that people should be really concerned about and, and seek help for, because there are some treatments that really work. Um, for me, one of the other things that I think complicated my own reintegration was that as a woman, I don't look like a vet. I don't fit the image, the stereotype that most people have in their heads of what a veteran is. So when groups of us would go hang out, uh, a lot of the guys would get recognized as veterans and, and thanked for their service. And that didn't happen as much for the women. And when I did bring up the fact that I had gone to war, people would ask me if I was allowed to carry a gun because I'm just a girl. And other people asked if I had been in the infantry, which was still not possible under under the, the regulations. So that sense that I had gone off to, to war for my country and been through this experience that was really profound and and shaped me in so many ways, and then come, came home to a society that just had no idea what types of things I, as a woman, was doing on their behalf. I think that complicated my own homecoming and made it a little more difficult to, you know, to fully reintegrate. So um, I I do hope that by sharing my own experiences of 
what made it harder to come home and, and how, for me, a lot of the challenges did naturally over time kind of fade. I, I hope it'll give other people the the context and understanding that, that there can be a, a valuable path forward. And when I look back, although there were some real challenges, of course, of the war and then of, of my homecoming, there are also benefits that I'm incredibly grateful for and wouldn't want to give up. I think I have a degree of perspective about what's really important in life. I don't care if you leave the toilet seat up because I'm still pretty happy that we have a toilet. Uh, I, I understand how incredibly lucky I am that my children will grow up uh, able to access medical care and really at very low risk of violence. The chances of bombs falling in our neighborhood are so low. And, and that that sense of of deep and visceral understanding of how lucky I am to live in modern America is is something that I would never want to give up. Kayla, you, you tell the story uh, of all the different episodes, of course, that happened with uh, Brian's insomnia and uh, some flashes uh, of anger. Um, the one story you tell was you just brought a foreign movie with subtitles and uh, he really had really struggled with that. Um, Yet in, I think it was February of, of 2005, uh, you got married after several months of, of dealing with your own reintegration and, and some of his struggles. Some people may look back and say, wow, that's really kind of a volatile situation. What convinced you, I mean, obviously you had feelings for mm -hmm. each other, uh, to, to pr pursue a, a, a marriage? Yeah, so we'd been dating for about a year at that point, and Brian had been transferred back to Walter Reed because he was not getting the care he needed at Fort Campbell. He had initially been sent from Walter Reed back to Fort Campbell, and he was just slipping through the cracks. He had a, um, a provider in charge of his care who didn't know anything about TBI, traumatic brain injury, or PTSD, and was not getting him the care he needed. So we, we worked to get him transferred back to Walter Reed. And then my own time in the military was going to end before too long, and so... In some ways, it was this practical decision. Okay, I will be able to go with him to his medical appointments. I will be able to have my household goods shipped there and, and keep my health insurance when I leave active duty. But of course, love is a big part of it, and, and sometimes the heart the heart wants what it wants, and isn't isn't always terribly rational. But there was also a part of me that felt an obligation uh, to Brian as as a fellow soldier the ethos of leaving no fallen comrade behind and tangled up in this, you know, you, you hear sometimes about politicians, there have been a couple of well-known politicians who have divorced their wives while their wives were getting treatment for breast cancer and you just, it it leaves such a nasty taste in your mouth. You think like, who does that? How how could you abandon somebody when they're, you know, going through a medical issue like that? And so Brian, it wasn't like he was just you know, born a jerk. He had been severely wounded in service of our country and um, needed help to recover, to heal from that wound that unfortunately in that those early days of the war, he just wasn't getting from the military. And so part of me did stay with him out of that sense of obligation to try to help him recover. We'll talk more about the story and how it developed in a very positive way eventually uh, when we come back with Kayla Williams on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, joined today in studio by Kayla Williams, veteran of the Iraq War, 101st Airborne Division in the U.S. Army. Her latest book, Plenty of Time, When We Get Home, Love and Recovery in the Aftermath of War. Her earlier book was uh, Love My Rifle More Than You, Young and Female in the U.S. Army. And uh, Kayla, we were talking about some of the more difficult moments, and unfortunately we didn't even get to the most difficult one yet. There was literally one point, I think before that you were married, where you had his gun with you in the bathroom contemplating suicide. Yeah, um, that was a real low point for me. I, you know, the deployment to Iraq showed me that I can get through anything that's going to end. <laughs> but there was a, a, there were a few moments with Brian where I thought, this is, there's no way out of this unless one of us dies because of my my sense of obligation that I felt I felt that if I did leave him that he would die. I thought that he would drink himself to death or you know drive drunk something would happen and he would he would would not survive if I left him. Um, and and I thought I can't get out of this. You know that there's no way for me to get out and I can't do this for the rest of my life. I can do anything that's going to end, 
but I can't do this for eternity. And so, yeah, there was a moment when I, when I thought that that, that that might be my only way out of a really difficult situation that I didn't know how to manage. Uh, so I did, I did think about it. Interestingly, one of the big turning points was when you needed to be taken care of. You were doing some rock climbing and broke an ankle and kind of seemed to snap in, in, into a caretaker mode, which you've obviously had been in for such a long time. Right. Um, right after we'd had a real crisis point in our marriage, I, I went rock climbing with a buddy from the Army, uh, and I fell and broke my ankle, and Brian had to take care of me, and I had to let him. <laughs> and that role reversal was really important for a number of reasons, partly because he was no longer able to just sit around and, and let me take care of him. He had to go and, and do the grocery shopping. He had to do the cooking. He had to do the cleaning. He had to um, take ownership for his life and, and mine as well to an extent for a while. And I, whether it's because I was in the military or it's just my natural personality, uh, I, I tend to do all the things. So if, if I'm not really good at talking about somebody's feelings, but if there are tasks to be done, I'm really great at accomplishing lots of tasks. So dealing with Brian's injury, I just accomplished everything. I just I took care of everything that needed to be done. And when suddenly I couldn't do that anymore, and I was forced to sit on the couch, uh, I was in a situation for the first time I had to really try to put myself into what it would be like to feel that way. Um, instead of just doing things, I had to think about things. I had to empathize with how it was for him to have some of his capabilities taken away from him. And, uh, and I also noticed how quickly when I couldn't do all the stuff I wanted to do, I started to get depressed and, and stop doing anything. You know, I, I, I stopped answering emails. I stopped doing anything useful and just sat there and felt sorry for myself. And that really helped me empathize with where he was and it started to kind of reset our relationship in a healthier, more balanced level where we were beginning to be more equal as a couple. And, and another way, much later, that, that seemed to help you a lot was meeting people who have been through similar situations. I think it was a Vote Vets group. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about that experience and how that helped. Yeah, so when Brian was finally medically retired from the Army, we both ended up temporarily on unemployment. I had a job offer, but it was taking a while to process all the paperwork to bring me on board. And he was just retired um, with kind of shorter notice than we expected after two years <laughs> in, the, in the system of trying to get him retired. So we both ended up on unemployment, and it was this it was this thing we were really ashamed of, to feel like we're both combat veterans, we've, we've served our country, we've done the right thing, and we're both on unemployment. How is this happening? And all of the struggles that we encountered trying to get Brian the care that he needed and trying to you know, work through the systems and, and get the needed supports, um, you know, we, we felt like it was some personal failing. And when we started to volunteer with an organization dedicated to getting vets elected to public office and then started to work on, on campaigns and engage with other veterans, it did several things that were really important. One was showing us that what we had experienced was not isolated and not due to personal failings, but were due to gaps in the systems that existed that should have been there to help us uh, get back on our feet. And two, gave us a community of people like us to work with on, on affecting positive change. Having that community was really valuable because we were able to bond with other people and, and share our experiences, be around people who didn't look at us like we were crazy if we flinched at sudden loud noises because they knew what it was like. Talk to people who had been in the same places, who who understood the, the same, spoke the same language that we did, the same army language that we did. That was really valuable. And then also working towards positive change, taking our own experiences instead of hiding them and being ashamed of them, uh, talking about them publicly to say, here's what we should do to try to improve things for all the people that are continuing to come home after us. And instead of just letting the terrible things that had happened to us, you know, mar our own existences to, to try to find a way to grow from them and, and to try to find that post-traumatic growth. And, and that deeper connection to society and find some meaning in our lives uh, as, as a result of and, and coexisting with the history of trauma. Let's talk a little bit about some of the frustrations along the way. Uh, you talked about the VA and the government's uh, lack of 
a coherent uh, system to, to address what you were dealing with and so many other veterans' families are, are dealing with. There was the, the Walter Reed condition scandal right around that same time. More recently, obviously, uh, the VA has been in the spotlight again. Um, what were the biggest frustrations for you specifically, and do you, do you feel like those are getting addressed now? So when Brian was going through the VA disability rating process, his was actually processed really quickly. I guess that was one of the benefits of being injured early in the war. Um, but for me personally, I think the, the biggest frustration was that there were no resources back then for caregivers. Uh, there, there was nothing in terms of training or support groups or information given to me as a wife, uh, as a spouse, about this is what traumatic brain injury is like, this is what post-traumatic stress disorder is like, here's how it might affect your family, here's what you can do, here's what you should do, here's how you can take care of yourself and not let this break you in the process. So that was, for me, a really huge gap. And I think that there has been a tremendous amount of work done to try to, to fill some of that. Um, there are training programs available now at most VAs provided by um, NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, um, on um, how on, uh, for caregivers. Um, there's a general one for mental illness, and there's a specific one for PTSD that's being rolled out. Um, there are a lot more support systems even for children now. There, there's just been a lot of investment on the DOD side and in the nonprofit world on how to support um, veterans and, and military families as a, as, a, as a whole. And then as well, uh, on the VA side, they've learned so much uh, in the past, um, it's been over a decade now, and, and I think are much better able to provide a lot of needed resources. I mean, when I first got out, VA was not doing nearly as good of a job of reaching out to uh, women veterans, and, and that outreach has really in, improved and increased, and. Um, we're much more likely to be recognized now when we walk into a VA as veterans ourselves instead of, you know, the assumption being that we're there just as a spouse. So that's been a, it's been an, it's been heartening to see the improvements as they've come. Certainly, I believe that there's more work to be done and, and hope that, you know, we as citizens will encourage those continued changes with congressional oversight and adequate funding. But, but it has been really rewarding to play some small role in encouraging the positive developments that have taken place. Uh, another issue, and you mentioned it a little bit before, when you, you'd go to a bar somewhere with, with other male veterans and they'd be recognized and, and the women oftentimes would not be. Uh, this is one of the first wars where, you know, you go back to World War II or Korea or Vietnam, most families had some sort of connection to somebody in service, less so this time. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you wrote your first book, you talk about it in here, not only were you going through a very difficult part of your, of your marriage at that point, but you were getting ridiculous, gruesome questions from people who didn't really have any understanding of what was going on there. What's your, how frustrating was it to go through all that and then have so many people who either weren't paying that close of attention or didn't really understand the right way to respond to what you had been through? Yeah, that, that was definitely a challenge when I came home. The, the sense that you know, the American public was kind of oblivious to the fact that we were at war. Um, that's something that hasn't necessarily changed. But one thing that I am concerned about today is that in some ways it feels as if there's this kind of weird dichotomy where the public perhaps, perhaps in some ways feeling guilty about how few of us do serve or have served recently, um, almost lionizes those who are serving really puts troops on a pedestal, and uh, I believe the U.S. military is currently the most trusted institution in America, uh, and there's this, just this almost blind support of, of the troops in this very generic sense, um, not questioning any aspect of, you know, what, what the military wants and just, oh, we have to give the generals what they want, and, and that, I think, in a democracy is a little dangerous and unhealthy, and maybe when more people have served or when you know more people who can serve, you can ask more probing questions, ask more difficult questions about what is the best way to employ our forces and, and you know, what, what controls do we want in place over our military? We have civilian controlled military for a reason in, in our democracy. Um, 
but then the flip side, so we, we, we lionize troops while they're serving, but then once we become veterans, it's almost like civilians then think that we're broken, right? Like, oh, yeah, you were in the military, so they just, there's this assumption that we're all unemployed, homeless, suicidal, maybe homicidal. There are these headlines that are just atrocious sometimes, like um, SWAT teams to get training on dealing with ticking time bomb veterans and, you know, this, just this focus on all the negatives. Um, you know, the vast majority of service members, when they become veterans over a lifetime, veterans are more highly educated, more highly employed, more highly paid than their civilian counterparts who have never served. Um, but yes, there are, uh, uh, there is a minority that really does struggle with the aftermath of, of service, which is why veterans, despite that general really positive outcome, veterans are also disproportionately represented in the homeless population. And, and they're, you know, they're, they do seem to be committing suicide at higher rates than the civilian population who's never served. So it's, it's a bizarre thing where those things can, can be happening at the exact same time. But I think, you know, when once we're veterans, a lot of, of the civilian population just kind of feels sorry for us or assumes that we're broken or thinks that our combat service has to have damaged us profoundly in some way. When although, yes, it was painful for, for many of us, it did also lead to some, some form of growth and gave us uh, perspective, gave us uh, skills that we bring home to our communities that we want to put to n use in new ways. A lot of us have you know, tremendous leadership experience that, that we're excited to, to bring to the civilian workforce. And so trying to, to get the, the right balance in terms of how to share the complexity and the diversity of our experiences is something I think a lot of us really struggle with. Just a couple of minutes left here. Sorry. Uh, Kayla, no, no, you're doing <laughs> fine. Um, obviously the question our audience is gonna wanna know now is how is Brian? Since the, we've kind of left off the story, you've had a, a couple of kids uh, and obviously your marriage is still going strong, but how's he doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so um, next week is our 10-year wedding anniversary. So really, thanks, it's, it's an exciting thing. It's been a, a long road to recovery. I, I liken it sometimes to the stock market. Uh, there's a steady upward trend over time, but if you zoom in on any small frame, uh, there's a lot of ups and downs in any short segment of, of that recovery. Um, so he does still struggle sometimes with, with, with depression, with anxiety, with some of the aftermath of war, with some cognitive deficits, but he has now recovered to the point that he's going to college using his GI Bill, and he's a, a great father to our children, and is really seems to be still moving in, in a really positive direction and we're becoming you know stronger members of our community and it's I'm very excited about what the next 10 years will bring and, and what kind of reaction have you gotten to this book um, I've gotten really positive reactions. Uh, I, it, got, it got good reviews, but for me, what's been the most fulfilling is hearing from people who have said, um, I thought I was doing okay, but after reading your description or after hearing you talk, I realized I do need to get some help and I've started seeing, seeking therapy. And so hearing from people from a variety of backgrounds, both in the military and outside of it, saying that they recognize some of those symptoms of post-traumatic stress and realize that their lives could be better and are seeking um, mental health care, that, that's really rewarding. And one of the interesting things is at the end of the book, you provide a, a long list of resources for folks who can tap into that community that, that was such a great asset for you and Brian. Right, absolutely. There are resources out there for troops, veterans, and military families. And it's also a way that, that civilians who are just interested can take a look and see if there's an organization they want to donate to or, or volunteer their time with. Okay, we're just about out of time. Anything else you'd like to add? Um, you know, I know a lot of people who say, oh, well, I tried going to a psychiatrist once and it didn't work out, so I've just never been back. And that's one thing I really urge people to, to fight. Uh, you know, if you bought toothpaste and you hated the flavor, you wouldn't quit brushing your teeth forever. You would just try a new flavor. So if you went to a psychiatrist and you didn't like medication, go see a psychologist, you know, go, go seek out equine therapy, whatever it is, try yoga. There is something that will work for the vast majority of people. So don't don't give up until you find it if you are struggling with, with mental illness. Kayla, thank you so much for your service and thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me. Kayla Williams is a veteran of the U.S. Army, 101st Airborne Division. She served in Iraq. She is the author of Plenty of Time When We Get Home, Love and Recovery in the Aftermath of War. Her first book, Love My Rifle More Than You, Young and Female in the U.S. Army. 
I'm Greg Corumbus reporting for Veterans Chronicles. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, we're at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.